Yeah, hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Bible Institute. Uh, we have been doing joint Bible studies, and we give God thanks for it. We've been focused on in the last several weeks about a very important um, spiritual spiritual command, a biblical command that teaches us forgiveness, forgiveness and in the extreme ways um, whereby the way Jesus taught it, we can apply it in extreme situations and even in situations where it seems exaggerated, where there are repeated um, instances of the same offense. Um, he tells us we should live a lifestyle of forgiving uh, because God attitude and heart uh, towards us is one of forgiveness. We know that that is how our relationship with God is restored, how Jesus, um, through his death on the cross, reconciled us back to our Heavenly Father. But we also know we have this guarantee that was written um, in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, I believe, where he says that um, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. And that was not um, the forgiveness of sin that leads to salvation. Because we know salvation is based on what we confess about Jesus as Messiah and the Savior of the Lord. He's talking about uh, when we sin. And, and when means there are going to be times when we would sin. And we would need the forgiveness of God to continue to walk in fellowship and the wholeness of our relationship with him. And the power of the Holy Spirit. And so that is given and God also encourages us to forgive. But as we have been seeing, it's a tall order. And many of us um, have in our own experiences and experiences of people we love, um, some very complicated and dynamic life circumstances uh, that makes you shake your head um, at the very notion of whether um, the offender, uh, even the events itself is deserving of forgiveness. Um, and so that's what we wanna to continue to talk about. And <clears throat> this whole concept of forgiveness has led us right into the Thanksgiving week for which we're absolutely grateful to God. Uh, we believe that thanksgiving, as well as forgiveness, is about relationships, uh, relationships with God and relationship with others. And we are believing and hoping that as we make the turn, as we begin to see light on the horizon at the end of the tunnel um, during this COVID-19 madness, um, as we see it winding down and not ramping up, um, that it well, once again, we begin to seek out, pursue, and embrace uh, the traditions that binds us together as families that makes our season festive. Um, I am just ab absolutely nostalgic about the holidays. I love the season. I love um, even the winter postcards, although we live in the beautiful and the United States Virgin Islands, where there's always white sand and no presence of snow. Um, we do get excited about the day that's ahead. And we are suggesting and encouraging all of you to become excited about Thursday. And if you haven't done so yet, and you know, if you think it's too late and all the turkeys are off the shelf, you can just get a simple turkey breast, a little cranberry sauce, invite some friends, or invite your next door neighbor and begin to um, share the reasons why you are thankful to God in this season for all of his kindness and his benefits to us, um, especially to those of the household of faith. Uh, so we welcome you. We are happy you're here as part of our conversations this evening. Um, Sister Carolyn, Dr. Richardson continue to be a part of our preparation and conversations, um, but I'm in the studio tonight um, with you and I'm asking you just for a little bit of your attention um, if you need to carry your laptop and your iPads into the kitchen as you continue to season and massage your turkey, um, but let us uh, turn our hearts to what God has prepared for us this evening. Uh, we're in chapter 10, and so for those of you who have the book written by Lisa, you can uh, forgive them what you can't forget. Uh, we invite you to um, turn to chapter 10, and we're going to begin our conversations at chapter 10. Um, as you can see, we're getting close to winding down. I believe there are 14 chapters. We have chapter 11, 12, 13, 14. And we look like we're going to be done for the Christmas holidays. And so the new year will meet us in a new study. Uh, but we are very uh, hopeful and prayerful that our uh, at length conversation about forgiveness 
would have brought about healing and transformation in many situations that you're presently um, coping with or dealing with, uh, even unresolved unforgiveness um, that just has been pushed aside and shoved and actually needs to be addressed. And so that's our heart for you. And we're excited by what God is doing in our lives. And we're also excited by what God is doing in your life as well. Could we bow our hearts and our minds and our lives as we go before the Lord in prayer? And then um, I'm going to ask you if there are any comments um, about what we read in chapter 10. I'd like to hear some of your um, comments and conversations as an introduction into the chapter. And then I'd like to share um, some thoughts about um, our conversation about unanswered prayer when we're being faced with unanswered prayer. Um, in our lives and when we're in that season where it seems like our prayers are not heard or God is not working. Um, we'd like to spend some time speaking about that and hope that our conversations will bring up, bring back courage to believe and, and hope make it alive in your hearts once again. Father, we love you. We thank you for your grace, your anointing, your presence, and your power in your life. We thank you for all of God's precious children, regardless of where they are in their journeys of faith. And Father God, we know that life the ups and downs of life, the, the, the waves that to toss us to and fro in life has us at different places. Sometimes when one of us is up, up the other is down. And that's why you say we are supposed to encourage each other, especially as we see the evil day approaching. And may you give us the discernment, may you, may you give us the faith, may you give us the courage um, not um, to <laughs> echo the sentiments of our own experiences, but to lead people to your divine promises, which are yea and amen. May in the light of our struggling, like Jacob, struggling with you, struggling with our faith, struggling with our life circumstances, may it bring us into a deeper revelation of who you are, uh, the God who is relentless, the God who loves us, the God who is gracious, and the God whose power created the heavens and the earth. And that is what Paul learned. <clears throat> as he wrestled with this thorn in his flesh in the book of Corinthians, he learned that your grace was sufficient and that your power was made perfect in weakness. And we are praying, Father God, even um, now in those difficult hardships of our lives, even as we endure and persevere by faith, that not only would you give us the grace and the strength, but we will see your glorious power in Godhead, that we will see your purpose and your plans that works all things out for our good and for your glory. May you get glory from our story and out of our pain. In the mighty name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. And God's people say, amen. <clears throat> amen. So what are your thoughts about chapter 10 when she shared about how they thought God would save them? And what did she meant? And how did this chapter um, resonate with you? as you were reading reading and are preparing for this evening's conversation. Anyone would like to share their thoughts or insights? Hi, good evening. I would good like to answer the Denise. Hi. Um, it was very, very powerful. It, there, there was a lot of dynamics in the thought. The thought that yes. she thought that, and, and once again, I picked this book up thinking of someone else. And then I think how much I can relate yes. because as she keeps talking, I said these things during 9-11. Yes. I think I said these words to you that she started out last time we spoke. I right. said, well, why didn't God do something? How come God didn't stop that from happening? How come? But it was so um, it was so profound how she went through. Now, I don't see Dr. Miller there, or I don't know if she's on. But on the psychology side, there is a Richter scale of death and dying. First, you, you're angry, and then you start bargaining, and then you start, and then when it doesn't happen, you go back to being angry. And she was 
trading off. Okay, God, well, if you do this, then I'll do that. But you have to do this first, then I'll do that. And it was just so amazingly um, powerful to identify with somebody else doing the same thing I did and realize that this is the stress of a situation. And how do we get to the application? This is kind of why I love um, Joyce Myers. She always talks about the application, how to apply something to everyday life, right? right? right. So now we go into the Bible and it's like speaking uh, our old time language. Whereas you need to know today, how to apply these things to today's life, you know, right. and how did, and I think I said, I don't know if I came to a resolution at that time, but I just can identify and not even empathize, identify what this person and what they were saying in my situation. So that was like the biggest things that stood out to me and then everything falls in place if you can get past that juncture, you know? But then she, she did, she just was angry and no longer wanted to um, have this reunion with her, her, her husband. She just was angry and needed to just deal with whatever situation, but it was a, a lot of anxiety for her. Yes. That's very true. She talked about how it took longer than she expected. And then at, at many times during the journey, she had an idea or a scenario in her head of how God would answer her mm -hmm. uh, right down to um, those false, uh -huh. what I would call like false sense of false opportunities. You know, the offender odd saying, yeah, I'm going to go to prayer meeting with you. And as they're praying, yeah. it's a powerful move of God, thinking that that would be the service that mm -hmm. God would reach and change his heart. And, and it wasn't the case. Yeah. You know, in the case yeah. that she went for breakfast after how she was choked up because she was so emotional, because she was so certain that God yeah. was going to move then, yeah. fix and correct her life based on her view um, of how it should be done. And, uh, and, and I, I believe our, our, our pain is compounded because many times we have ideas or scenarios as to how, um, as to how God is going to fix our um, situations. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it has to do with us, if we're honest, being in a position of pride, being the one who's exhausted and other person totally decimated, uh, people coming back crawling on their hands and knees. And, you know, so when we really think about it, it's not God-centered at all, it's self-centered uh, as to what we want out of it. Um, and uh, even our questions about God and his sovereignty sometimes shows that our perspective has us at the center of the universe and has removed God from his, his central role in the affairs of life. And, and so that is so good, but it's true. We all can identify. And it's amazing when good things happen in our lives and when we get the outcomes we want, we are so quick to go and tell a story. And when we listen to ourselves, sometimes as we're sharing, even as we're testifying, you can almost hear a self bleed into those testimonies where we are taking the credit, you know, about how we prayed and the power of our prayer and you know, how God responded to our prayer. It almost seemed like it was our prayer that worked the magic and not the hand of God. Um, sometimes we think because we did something right and everybody else who didn't get an answer did something wrong. Maybe it's how we fasted, where we did a father day fast or 21 day fast. There's, there's always some self that begins to bleed into the story. But it's um, interesting that when we don't get all outcomes we want, how God gets all of the blame. You know, it becomes clear that he's the one, you know, who is failing us because we are praying and we are believing and, you know, we seem to be checking all the boxes, but it's still not adding up to the outcome we want. And so what is faulty is not us. What is faulty is God. And, and that's where we become disillusioned, where we lose hope. She thought about seasons of putting away her Bible, of it being difficult to pray, becoming a prayer agnostic and all those things. And I believe... Uh, if we're honest, um, there are many, many uh, Christian people who may not have asked hard questions, but has quietly um, reached into those, what I call those wastelands, those, those desolate places uh, where it's hard to be moved or touched or respond 
um, to the spirit and the, and the presence and the power and the person of God himself. Um, and so it's, it's really important that we have those conversations and be honest, uh, because also I believe for us to make that turned around like Elijah, who went all the way to the cave. He was in the same place, you know. He was depressed. He openly admitted it. He told God that he wanted to die. <laughs> That's the side of depression. He told God that uh, he alone was left. There was nobody else serving God, uh, you know, that, you know, I wanted out, you know, find me a successor. This is not working. And God just had to remind him of something that was not true, that his limited perspective, um, perspective because he was being chased, chased down by um, Jezebel and King Ahab, uh, had totally warped his view of the battle, totally warped his view of the outcome. And God was telling that we have reserves, you know. Uh, what you're experiencing now is not the end of the story. Um, and you just came from a mighty miracle where you call fire from heaven. And that's the highlight. But how quickly, you know, faith melts away under persecution and hardship. Um, and so that's interesting as we live out that, those dynamics, both in Lisa's story and even our own lives, um, for us to really pay, pay attention to that. Uh, but thank you for sharing, Sister Daniels. Yeah, anyone else who would like to um, join in or uh, share any insights they may have had from, from engaging um, the reading material or listening to our conversation so far? Yes, pleasant good evening, everybody. This is Fire. The Minister Fire. God bless him. Yes, I'm coming in for a sneak peek classes in about... Uh, 30 minutes or so because of the time change. I said, let me come in, let me get a little sneak peek. Yes. And uh, so, <laughs> and listening to the sister earlier, you know, um, the story of Joseph came to me. Yes. And I was like, wow, Lord, you know, because here it is, you know, that you were explaining about 9 11 and happening and why did it happen and God, why did you do this and do that? You know, and I thought about Joseph and I'm like, here it is, his brothers plotted against him because of the dream that, you know, God had given to him. And they were so, instead of them trying to say, well, you know, I, I think what happened with them was they didn't like the idea that the younger, they have to be bowing down to the younger because they were the eldest. You right. know? And instead of them trying to have a decent conversation amongst themselves, amongst for the little brother, you know, they could have said, well, I didn't like that dream or whatever, but no, they went way over to the deep end. They throw him in the pit. Then they had to create another story for the father to believe and make it, created another lie to cover up that story. And then they turn around and talking about um, what profit it is for them to kill him. I did, they, now they're thinking on money now. They, now they want to benefit off of their brother. And I'm like, wow. So they sold him, and then he got sold into slavery, and then he ended up in the king's palace, in, sorry, in a dungeon. And then all these things had to transpire in order for him to get to where he was going. Now, yes, he had a dream, but I don't think he knew that what was going to occur, because I don't know, honestly, right? If my family member throw me in a pit, I don't know how I would have been feeling, uh, honestly. I don't know how they're mad. I don't know if they're upset. And then suddenly you're still turning and sell me for money? You know, so it's like, I'm like, God, how did you allow Joseph to maintain, you know, all of this that transpired? But in the end, God ensured that the dream came to pass. Because yes. sometimes there are people, they're looking at what's going on, what you have said and what we have said. And then they're trying to counter because they don't like the idea of what is going on. Yes. So sometimes that's the reason why I think also why Christ was also in prayer every morning. Because when he had to go during the day, there were things that he had to deal with, okay, from the spiritual aspect to keep him in, how should I say, in the will of God to do God's will. Because the other thing came to me the other day when I was thinking about when Jesus said, don't you think I could have called 10,000 angels and he set me free? And I was like, but wait, you know, could I just buff off and say, man, I don't care about these people. Jesus Christ is buff off. Yes. But he didn't. He humbled himself to his father's will and plan. It's not all the time we understand everything. And I could jump to Job and then I got to stop. Because I'm feeling this thing coming. You know, and even with Job, 
He had four messengers come to him back to back with negative messages. And the word of God said, Job rent his clothes, shaved his head, and worshiped God. That, that keeps catching me every time. It catches me every time. I say, Lord God, increase my faith. And that's all I say to you all tonight. I love you all. God bless. I'm going to make this short and sweet. Love you all, LAT. All right. God bless you, Fire. And what was an interesting introduction um, in your statements is um, the role of God's will. Uh, we know that um, theologian speaks of a God's sovereign will, and then also speaks about his permissive will. Um, and I believe they go to um, four conversations about the four aspects of God's will. Um, but one of the things we know that his will is perfect, and um, and we have to come to terms with that. And sometimes we wrestle to life. Uh, circumstances it brings us face to face with God's will uh, even as the Lord Jesus Christ himself he's praying and he didn't make a request he said father if it is possible so he still made it contingent on God's will if it is possible if it's in the realm of your permissive will let this cup pass from me but he was also God the son he knew that without the shedding of blood man's sin could never be repaid um, and so that was that was the crux of what brought him to earth. He said, nevertheless, um, let your will be done. And so he was he he totally submitted to the will of the Father, even to death on the cross, as cruel as that is, and we saw the passion of, of the Christ and the passion of the cross and how much he suffered and how much it cost him, uh, right on to and uh, giving up his human life. And that's what Moses said, a life for a life. You know, that's what um this the sacrifice of the old testament was to show that that an innocent animal had to lose its life so that the sins of, 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 of people could be forgiven. And um, it was symbolic of the Lord Jesus Christ having to give his life so that the sins of you and I could be forgiven. Um, but Jesus understanding um, the whole concept, the, the one of the, what I call one of the overshadowing factors as we are praying and as we're living out our circumstances is this whole factor of God's will. What is God's will? And discerning what God's will is. And there are some people, some of the people who are dogmatic because they believe from you know litmus test phrase value, they know what God's will is. But um, the scriptures tell that the who knows the will of God is the Spirit of God who searches out all things, both hidden and revealed. So the Holy Spirit of God searches out all things both revealed and hidden so he doesn't only look at life the way we look at life which is um, the visible world the known world uh, from our uh, senses but he also searches out the the mysteries of the unseen or the invisible or the unknown world and he he understands what is the heart and the will of of god the father and so when we are praying and one of the benefits of prayer is that we uh, partner with the Holy Spirit, who's the chief intercessor, who leads us into all truth. Because Jesus said in the Gospel of John 17, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will guide you or lead you into all truth. And one of the ways we submit to him as our guide into leading us into all truth is through the spiritual habit of prayer. That we are not, uh, prayer is not given to us as a means of um, twisting the hands of God to accomplish our objectives. Prayer is us submitting to the Holy Spirit as our tour guide, um, who guides us because that is what he does. He's going to guide you as a, a chief intercessor, leading you through prayer into the mysteries of God, known, visible, and unknown, and to search out the heart of God. And he will guide and lead us into all truth. And that is a process, and it is, it's a journey. It's relational. Uh, and it's how we learn to grow in our faith and to trust God. But as you're going through difficult circumstances, it's a, it's a hard conversation to have. And so that's why we're sharing this message in love. And um, I want to, to hear your thoughts. So that as we're talking about unanswered prayer and does God love us and does God even care, um, as we address those thorny theological uh, questions or concerns, um, we, we could be doing it in a practical way. Um, way that's applicable to your everyday life and that brings not only hope but healing and help uh, for your current situations 
Any other thoughts or, or, or input at this time? You know, good night, good night, everyone. Good night, Brother Craig. Yeah. You know, um, as I listened to Sister Fire, particularly, and she talked about Joseph, and that story is, you know, many of how many times you read it, you listen to it, it's, it's always, you always grapple with it. But as that, as I listened to her, and, you know, how well, we all wonder how could Joseph forgive them, you know? And I, I find myself in a, a similar situation where, you know, my prayer is to have a stronger relationship with God. And, you know, we, we've, we've talked about the cost of that. And, you know, as you, as you go to, as you go to this life and you, you deal with different circumstances and the closer you get to God, you, you know, because I too grapple with Joseph's story and how and how and how. And as I grapple with that, I, I also realize in my story, how much, I let go of things that I never saw myself letting go of. And because of those, and because of me being able to let go of those things, it makes forgiveness easier for me, right? And so, um, but the process of it is just, it's just daunting, it's just difficult. And, and but you don't realize that until you, until you get through it. And sometimes, you know, you don't always say the right thing, you don't always do the right things. Um, but when it comes from a place of love, even it's delivered, even a delivery is not, you know, prim and proper, if you will, for lack of a better word. Um, you know, at the end of the day, after over time, you realize, wow, and they realize, other people, other persons realize, wow, we came from a good place, but it was just, uh, for me, it was hard for me to accept. It was hard for me to say even as a person saying it. And, but, you know, it all boils down for me, what I've learned, um, not just through the study, but even through the process of forgiveness is, you know, the end game is to have a relationship with God, a stronger relationship, grow your faith. Um, and God reveals things in your life, answers prayers in your life to give you that hope, to give you that strength, to give you that faith, ultimately, right? Um, and so when we get to those places where we have somebody that, that offends us or hurts us, you know, it's, it's for me, it's those moments is why I reflect upon. And I don't know how it happens because it's not something that I intentionally, like, okay, I have to stop and forgive well, because I'm mad, right? But then in those moments, it's like there's another element of me that, that is able to be patient in my response, one, and how, oftentimes, not all the time. And, and then the day goes by and then you'd be like, wow, I actually didn't make a big deal out of that, even though I would have. Uh, months or years back. So for me, it's 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 about that relationship that you seek to have with God and understanding the cost, even though we don't always understand, but I think the reflection helps us. And when we look at where we came from and where we are, I think that that really helps with uh, with the forgiveness part and relationship with God and how we are growing. And when we see that growth and we understand, wow, it's because I did this or I didn't do that, you know, cause and effect. So for me personally, is that relationship with God and obviously Joseph, Job, um, these men had a, 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 a yawning for God. I always talk about, you know, the heart of God and, and, and what does it really look like to get that close? Me and Brother Elkin had a conversation a couple of years back about what is it, what does it require um, to solve God and truly solve God? And he, he says to me, giving up yourself. And that was hard for me to grapple with. Today, I could see why he said that to me. And that was that. I think that was nine, eight, nine years ago. So you know, that relationship, that seeking, that yearning for the relationship with God, I think is what helps us in, in those periods of having to forgive someone who we know probably don't deserve it. Yes. And that's another um, point that was actually uh, mentioned or alluded to in this chapter, but really prayer and sometimes even going through the valleys of the circumstances we're going through is really, um, it's about relationship. It's more relational than event driven. And a lot of times we get focused on events, we get focused on the historical data, who did what, when, timelines, um, the tit for tat, what comes for the chicken or the egg. And we go to a lot of scenarios and we keep rehearsing those hearts, but we, we miss the journey about how it was all relational. And even the aspect of, of coming into um, an era or place of questioning is also a part of the journey of faith and growing. 
Uh, we saw in the life of even David, you know, David did ask some very profound questions uh, in the book of Psalms. And, and several times as I was reading them, it made me realize because they were the man of the God's own heart that it, you, you, you can have Christians within the context of a, of a healthy relationship um, because both the person asking the Christian and the person entertaining the Christian shows that they believe in the strength of the relationship to enjoy the Christian. Uh, and that's a powerful statement, you know, uh, when people get um, uh, unnerved by someone having Christians experience and doubt, um, it shows that they are afraid um, that it would go to the core of the relationship and the cause of the relationship and unravel. But not so with, with God and our relationship. You say, cast all your cares upon me because I care for you. And I think it's not only a matter of our concerns, but also our Christians. You know, and uh, we, we, we saw that several times in the scripture. And they, Job himself came to a place of questioning. And we saw that God encompassed him and he actually experienced the power of God in his Christians as well. And I have no doubt that Joseph uh, went through a similar seasons that as he's seen his life played out and and he, him falling further and further away from the dream as he saw it he's like going the opposite direction as to what was revealed to him in in his in his dreams um he could have had a lot of doubt that maybe the dreams were premature maybe you know he imagined them maybe you know they were never going to happen um and so forth and then it came to a point where you know he he put him on park, you know, like he tried to put him out of his mind. And so that that's also mind for us to remember that, you know, even as you see God working your life, that every situation is different. And I would like to share two situations with you. One happened after the other, but the situations like Sion, you know, 25 minutes seem like an eternity because of what you believe in for. You see a child not breathing, um, turning blue uh, for us by all intents and purposes, those who were actively working on him, uh, helping him to breed. Um, Sister Deborah, who was a nurse, Brother Joshua, Minister Joshua, who was a firefighter, both says for them he had gone. He was clinically dead. Uh, but you see God bringing him back to life. And that happened in 25 minutes. It happened the same um, same day. You know, So when you see something like that, that is so drastic, that is such a big demand in our faith, and you see um, God responded with, then when you Facing other life situation that seems smaller than that. But yet, instead of God doing something miraculous, you have to work through it and grow through it. You have questions. And my mind goes back to a time when um, I'd become indebted for the first time uh, because both myself and my wife was in college and I began to toy around with credit cards after shunning them all in the courtyards of the University of Texas at Austin. Finally began to acquire one and felt the power and the surge of that because of using other people's money. And then it led to some others and totally got entangled with it until it became a frustration, the phone calls, the embarrassment, the pain of not working and not knowing where the money would come from. And um, how God set me free was amazing, you know. Um, I had another friend uh, who was a in his profession for many years, 25 years practicing as a, an attorney, uh, very affluent and um, needed the help of some debt counseling. He referred me to some people, made a phone call, um, ignored the program for three months, but when the calls became very decided to do that. And um, remember that suddenly the plan, this, this lady told me because I actually was anxious to know the outcome. She said, I'm going to take you seven plus years before you see the end of, of uh, the daylight on this, the end of day on this. And, um, and during that process, uh, God spoke to our hearts. We were still students, actually getting student loans. God spoke to our hearts about Titan. I told my wife that that did not apply to us because uh, loans were not income. <laughs> uh, after much discussion, we felt conviction otherwise. We're going to a very prominent church. It showed that by all intents and purposes, when you look around the facilities and grounds, they didn't need money. Uh, but we began to tie out of our student loans. Uh, was a very humbling thing, but it was obedience to God. Did not see any immediate uh, miracles, but felt the burden, the pain, uh, the burden, or uh, the anxiousness of having yet what I considered, because I wasn't counting it all joy, uh, another bill. 
And so I went to that. And then one Sunday, I was um, in church, heard Brother Shambach, uh, who was the guest speaker preaching, got excited because I used to listen to him on the radio while I was in, growing up in the island of Anguilla. And now in this big state of Texas and hearing him preach at a prominent church was really beside myself. And then he said something that was directly to my sister. And he said, I want you to get all your bills together and fold us. Man, I went to, um, it wasn't um, Office Max, it was Office Depot. I went to Office Depot, got folders, got them in all the folder, organized my files. I swear, you know, in my mind, my scenario would have been that at some point in the service, you know, God would have moved on some rich person's heart in the audience or, you know, the church itself, and they would just start canceling people's debt. So I believe that would have been the night. And as he comes to the end of the service, regular summary, freedom of everything, faith, healing. Uh, I'm thinking, when is going to be with the money part? You know, and he was finally did. Uh, as he's getting ready to close, he said, all of those, if you remember, like he, it was an afterthought. If you brought your bills, I want you to wave them at me. So I am standing up at this time while all participating in waving the bills. And then he asked us to throw them down on the ground. We did. And then he asked us to stomp on them. And I began to jump on those. And I got so excited. I don't know if it was flesh or the spirit, but I got so excited jumping up on those bills. And then afterwards, he said a prayer for us. And, um, and then we were supposed to hunt and fish our uh, fold those back on, under the chair and go back home. And I remember the feeling I had immediately after the service and for a few days after. But I'm going to tell you what happened, which was the biggest miracle. And I think it was part of the process. I remember driving from Houston, going back to Austin one day. And I began to pray and worship God. And actually in that uh, conversation of worship, felt a release in my spirit that for the first time, something I thought would have never ended that would have been enduring for a long time. I felt that God was going to bring me up uh, miraculously, but I didn't know how. I began to worship him with that perspective. And I am alive to tell you that instead of seven plus years, as the leader predicted, within two and a half to three years, God allowed me month by month, uh, sending in my payments and then began to use a snowball and increasing our payments, totally became debt free in terms of unsecured debt. Um, at that time, we didn't have a home, so it became totally debt-free and was just beside myself, giddy. Uh, but you wouldn't know the courage and the faith and also the skills um, and, and the tenacity and the perseverance that has taught me. So that later in life, when I would be faced with similar situations, um, I've always been able to um, use the same power and ability that I learned during that season to work my way out by faith out of um, similar circumstances. And so now looking back, God could have delivered me instantly, but I would, I would have learned no lessons uh, from that. But he chose rather to let me learn a very painful process of working myself out of what seemed like absolute desperation and something that would not turn around to trust him month by month, day by day uh, to provide um, the means by which I could free and untangle myself um, through a process of time. And so that's something we have to learn and believe in. But yes, you can lose um, hope, you can lose faith, and you can also lose perspective um, when you are more dealing with a long-term response to your never-ending prayers about a particular situation and not seeing God work it out in the many or several ways you had imagined before. Any other thoughts or, or, or questions before I share about how, about this whole concept of unanswered prayer? I know she also mentioned about sometimes feeling like God doesn't, um, love us or God doesn't care, but I think the scripture speaks directly to that, so that's a position of faith. You know, he says, cast all your cares upon me because I care for you. That's something you just have to you have to relearn and you have to relearn it by acceptance, true faith, that what God says is true and everything else we may feel or believe is a lie. Um, and anything the enemy tells or tries to sow in our hearts and mind is a lie. Uh, but I'd like to speak up on answered prayer and I'll just share a few things with you about that um, as we continue our conversation about chapter 10 um, and, and the thought God would save them. Anyone else would like to share the benefit of their thoughts or insights before we go into a sharp Bible study about unanswered prayer?
I have one last thing before I, I, I dip to class. And um, the thing I came to mind was, yeah, go ahead. Was, um, was Ephesians 4, uh, 32, where it says, and be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. You know, just as God gave us, he took the time and patience with us to get to where we need to be in him. And then when we go before him in prayer and ask him for forgiveness and he forgave us, we have to render or reciprocate that same thing towards our brother, despite no matter what goes on, because we were just as bad as they were, you know, and who are, who are we to be judging them and not try to forgive them when God, when we ask God to forgive, you know? So I, I just want us to just look at that and think about it. You know, let it simmer a little bit that, you know, here it is. I come to God. God forgive me my sins. He forgives me. He gives me patience and he work with me the same. Therefore, you have to also do the same and reciprocate to your brother, your sister, whoever it may be, co-worker, whatever it may be. So that, once again, that he and Pastor Pastor also for you as an individual to actually reciprocate who God is, which is love, you know, and we must extend that grace to one another. God bless. Y'all see y'all. God bless. God bless you as well. And I will also be talking about that in the in the in the, in the avenue or in the realm of unanswered prayer. And so here's some of the thoughts. Pastor Carl. Pastor Carl. Yes. May yes. I say Sister Janelle, go right ahead. Yes. Hi. No, I was thinking you you were talking about with your student loans and the debt that that you had, <laughs> and that you learned by having to wait and not get in this instant miraculous divine <clears throat> answer to your prayer but you know um i think to, and then they were talking about um joseph and how his brother sold him and you know you learn the lesson you learn these life lessons that um has molded you into the person that you've become Yes. And I think too, in, in learning life lessons, I think that we also learn patience. And yeah. I think we learn to know how to um, wait without murmuring and bickering. But in that waiting, we, um, we develop our character, our faith, our listen even um a, a, a new career a new everything a new life yes. you know besides <laughs> life lessons if we are truly waiting for god's answers answer and and his timing and not pushing pushing and being disgruntled and oh yeah keep praying for this and i don't know how them people could get a present and blah 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 but if we wait in a in a sense of of hum humble patience you know like we yes. want to be humble about this but uh, you know and still exercise courage you know it's like i like to say getting up every day putting one foot in front of the other until you make it you know and then um i don't know if it's a scripture where it said like while you're waiting on god while you're on the shelf you know you're not just there on the shelf occupying space it's like occupy we occupy until he comes oh, so we keep we keep, yeah, occupy until he comes. So when you occupy and you keep moving, you keep doing, you keep living, you keep, you keep doing everything that you're supposed to do and not just sitting with your hand on your head, right? Waiting, right, right, but that right. you continue to live, you continue to experience, you continue on the journey until, until our father says, okay, I think she's learned the lesson. I think that she can handle this. Thing that she's been praying for because then we wouldn't be able to handle it then we'll mess it up you know and so i think that that's a, um yeah the life lessons that we learned and that we learn and the character building that um takes place uh um i think that's what what our waiting period you know is is all about yes and I truly believe that too as well, that life is more about the journey than the outcome. And so many times we kind of focus on the outcome out of pride, you know, like uh, this, this successful ending. 
but there's so much that is um, read out of our stories when we just narrow in or zero in on the the success sound bites instead of the whole journey or process of our lives you know um our relationships our marriages our rearing of our children what we got right what we got wrong it all goes into the fabric as you see of those life lessons of god working for our good and his glory you know um even the ugly watts you know, when to whom it comes to birth defects and could become beautiful, um, uh, could be, become beautiful distinguishing marks of our lives. Uh, I think about uh, my wife who has a mole um, on the side of her face. Uh, some places, many people want a mole, but I, I, I see it as a, a distinguishing mark. And whenever I see it, I, I smile, I see it as a mark of beauty. Um, that's upon our face. And I believe that that life lessons are the same way. You know, that's why Joel ever says, you meant this for evil. You know, what initiated this, what spurred this, what gave birth to this was evil, evil motives, evil intents. But God worked it out for good. And it wasn't just my good, but it was for the good of people I couldn't even imagine. Because um, through the process of you selling me into slavery, it it brought about a chain of events that put me in the proper place at the proper time to interpret the dream of a frustrated Pharaoh and become the administrator of bringing that wisdom to pass. And in doing so provided food and famine, seven years of famine for the nations of the regions of the world surrounding Egypt. Because we know from the brothers' experience that hard there was food in Egypt and many of the surrounding regions who are also experiencing famine in the Middle East uh, went to Egypt and found help, found relief from this uh, blistering famine that was ravishing that, that region. And so Joseph, by God's um, grace and by God's anointing, was able to see how um, an evil offense, an evil event, was actually being worked out uh, from the unknown world, the unseen world, the unseen realm by the hand of God into something that has a wide range impact for good and that was a blessing to other people. And if he was also be truthful, a blessing to himself. And here's the irony, and even a blessing to the offenders because they themselves found bread in the midst of famine. And when they came into Egypt, they were given the best of the land, Goshen. And so just imagine, just imagine that 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 blows your mind. When you think, when you think about the power of God to work in our human weakness, in our human mess, and to bring out beautiful melodies, a beautiful, a strike of beautiful chord in the pain and the suffering of our stories. And the same is with Jesus Christ and the resurrection, uh, his suffering on the cross, the resurrection on the tomb. And there are so many other stories like it, like Sister Jenna said, every blonde, so many lessons from other people's stories and also from our own. Um, and it's also from a point of encouraging us um, to persevere, to endure, and not to lose faith, not, not to lose faith and not to faint. And so that's the love with which we're coming at you through this message. We don't want you to lose heart. We don't want you to faint. We want you to re-engage. Like Sister Jenna say, we want you to understand your latent or your, your, your potential power, which comes in embracing and living out your values in the world. And that's what a lot of people understand. Success is you living out your values in the world, contrary to how you're being treated. And that's what the Bible says, when you're being hated, love. You know, when you're being despised, forgive. When you're being ill-treated, show kindness. Is he saying, you know what? Don't allow anyone to deter you from living from your value system, because love overcomes or triumphs over evil every day of the week. Um, and the other beautiful part about Joseph's life that we see is that there's aspects to our prayers, our dreams that does not realize in our lifetime. And one of the aspects of Joseph's dream that he prayed about and that he wanted was that he would be buried with his ancestors, that his life would not end, his story will not end in Egypt. 
And we know that for many, many years, probably around the extent of 400 years, Joseph died. He was buried in Egypt, probably had an official uh, funeral. Uh, he was buried among um, the nobles of the land of Egypt. Um, but he, he said, you know, when you guys get delivered, I don't know when, but when it happens, you take my bones, <laughs> these dry bones. You make sure uh, out of all the things God was going to give you from the wealth of your oppressors, you remember my bones and you walk with my bones when you are leaving um, Egypt. And for 400 years, they told that story almost like it was um, maybe humorous. You know, Joseph said, take his bones. And then sure enough, as they're leaving, Somebody remembers the irony of it. Remember, Joseph said, take his bones. And sure enough, they kept the word and took Joseph's bones out of Egypt and laid it with his ancestors. So we see that there are sometimes aspects of our prayers and our dreams that is realized after we have lived, but God is faithful to perform them even then. And so we bless him on his name. So when we wrestle with unanswered prayer, uh, one of the challenges is, like I've said, we see God do amazing things. And then we say, but why not now? Why not this? How come when I prayed for this, I, he answered me and it didn't take so long. And when I prayed for this, he answered me. When I was in distress about this, he answered me. But in this one situation, whether it's um, relational or whether it's financial, like I, I share with you, or whether it's something else, um, a parent child, a raising a difficult child, why? is this one uh, requiring so much prayer, so much fasting, so much believing. Uh, I'm weary uh, with the enormous prayer effort and faith effort and, and believing and trying, um, you know, turning the other cheek, and, you know, sowing good uh, when I've only gotten a, a negative or evil return. Uh, how is it possible? As we continue down this tunnel of chaos, how can we keep believing when it doesn't seem like God is working. And Lisa made a reference to a story in regards to the, to the disciples. And that's why the chapter has this very interesting um, topic, uh, 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 what is the title? And the thought that God would save them. And she's making reference to the disciples' belief because they were believing not for a Messiah or Savior, that will save us as we now teach and preach from their sins so that they can have a place in heaven when they die or uh, uh, have uh, this eternal hope of spending eternity with God. They were looking for an earthly Messiah. They were looking for an earthly ruler. They were looking for someone to bring an end to the oppression of Rome. And, and that's what they believe. And besides, Jesus is, is ramping up his, his conversations and his messages about um, going to Jerusalem to die. They are making preparation to reign. And they're starting to discuss uh, cabinet's positions, who's going to sit on the right hand when he takes his place at the, at the cabinet table. Um, they want to know delegation of scope of authority and powers. And G Jesus um, sympathizes with them because he realized that their, their motives are amiss and they're looking at this the wrong way from their limited perspective. Uh, but he tells them in the Gospels that when, the, when he dies, they're going to grieve. And uh, we've talked about a deep sorrow, deep pain. And we saw this on the Emmaus Road. And they said, and we thought that he would have saved us and remained in Israel. Um, but now he's dead. He's been dead for three days. Um, we see that reality. And, just in, and Jesus telling him it's going to be like, he makes the reference, it's going to be like a woman in travail who's given birth, who when the moment comes to give birth, is such great pain that, that all that sh that's the only thing she's aware, about, aware of. But then after the baby is born, the grief turns into joy. And that is what Jesus promised them. That this grief would not be replaced with joy, but the very grief itself would lead them into joy. That this, this grief of losing, of, 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 of seeing their limited perspective of an earthly kingdom destroyed would bring them into a broader perspective into a larger space into a greater understanding of who Jesus is uh, what he represents in terms of his eternal kingdom power and Godhead and we are so glad with the apostles who boast about his suffering and his resurrection 
that Jesus Christ allowed us to grieve, knowing that in time, through the process of time, our grief, the pain of losing, um, will bring us into joy, will be turned into joy. And, and that is in the scriptures. And that was a powerful um, way of showing us that there are some, some circumstances like Joseph that has to happen to us because that those are the circumstances that are leading us into the joy that God has planned and purpose for our lives. That the way to the promised land is through the Red Sea. The way to the promised land is through the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. The way into conquering our fears and our giants that is before us is going through all of the processes and means by which our other minds could tell us this is not necessary. We could have been exempted from this. Um, and why did it require so much effort? Why did it require so much faith? Why did it require so much prayer? Only God knows. But like Sister Jenna says so eloquently, it is about life lessons. It is about our relationship with God. And as we are working through this, these instances in our lives, our relationship with God can only grow deeper and richer. And I get that revelation from Job himself. Job had many tragic losses. Job was busy worshiping. He knew how to worship. He even had the right response when he heard about all these tragic outcomes. The Bible said that he would make um, offerings, create altars and offerings for his children, less at any time during their reveling and their parties they had sinned. Uh, but Job, who had such um, a level of relationship with God before his tragic events, said this after his questioning and after coming face to face with God. He said, I've heard about you before. He says, but now I know you. That was a very interesting revelation. I don't think he was saying like, I didn't really know, but you were really saying, you know, I thought I knew you. I thought, I mean, you were good. I thought it was close or deep in my relationship or in my faith, but having gone through what I've gone through, it made me realize that now I know you and in terms of the essence. And that discovery in our walk with God it cannot, could never be taken away from us. And then once life leads you into those deeper truths, those deeper revelations of God, that can never be beaten out of you or taken away from you, especially when they are born out of grief or born out of trials. Um, and that's why Paul said that the sufferings of our present times they, they will be made to look so small in light of the glorious purposes and plans of God for our life. So yes, we're being shaped. And from our earthly perspective, we can have a view of outcomes that never materialize because those views or scenarios are shaped by our sufferings, our pain, and our hurts. And Lisa spoke about the season when she prayed and seen nothing change. And sometimes and many times we grow hopeless, hopeless, blinded by our unmet, unmet expectations. So have an unmet expectation, we become hopeless, we begin to lose faith, lose faith in prayer, lose faith in God. And we said, why is prayer not working? And prayer becomes a mystery for us. And we become exhausted and astubated by prayer itself. We say, why does it work sometimes? Why does not work sometimes? And and that makes us anxious. It makes us feel like, okay, I really don't understand prayer. I don't understand what it takes for the work because when I do everything Pastor Carl says or the Apostle says, uh, sometimes I get outcomes, I get getting excited, and other times it seems like, yep, yeah, it's not working. Um, so we read examples, Mark 11, 24. He says, therefore, I tell you, Jesus speaking, watch over your acts in prayer. Believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Then we pray and we don't see the answer to our prayers and we're left struggling. So one of the things I want us to realize uh, that the Bible actually deals with unanswered prayer. It deals with it in many forms and fashions and in countless ways. And so one of the first uh, myths, one of the first misunderstandings we have they have the impression that every situation in the Bible turns out good and everything is peachy and there's always positive outcomes and every prayer that has been raised in the scriptures actually got the desired response. 
but I wanted to share with you, and it's clear, both from the scriptures and our own experiences, that there are occasions, and I'm going to use the word seems, because that is from our perspective, that prayers seems to go unanswered. So what are some examples of prayer that seems to have gone unanswered? We remember Abraham's intercession on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah. You remember when the Lord Jesus Christ came and he says, can I do something to earth without speaking to my friend Abraham? He tells Abraham what he's about to do and Abraham begins to intercede. He talks about it just 50 and he goes all the way down and then he stops. But we see where his intentions, uh, the outcome he wanted, which was Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah to be forgiven and to be relieved of the, the coming damnation of judgment. Um, that that went unheard. So we have that in Genesis 18, 16 through 23. Then we see David, um, you know, this is a, a, a result of his sin. But we saw with a child, the first child of Bathsheba, uh, we know that it went on to have other children after they became married. But the first child of Bathsheba, we call it his love child, became sick and gravely ill and was at the point of death. David prayed both for he is a Bathsheba's child in 2 Samuel 12, verses 15 to 23. But the child died. The child died. We saw David's perspective after that as well. But that's another example of unanswered prayer. David prayed earnestly on his face for the child to live and the child die. Then we have another example. Paul repeated requests um, for God to release him from a thorn in his flesh. We've never been really given an example of the thorn in the flesh, and it's led to a lot of um, speculation, spiritual speculation, as to what Paul's thorn in the flesh could have been. But we know that he desired to pray and fast it, to be released from it, to be healed of it, <coughs> for it to be fixed. Like how we say we want God to fix our problems. Second Corinthians 12, 7 to 10, and that he didn't get the answer that he was looking for in terms of it uh, being fixed. Um, John the Baptist had, had an indirect request to be free from prison. Matthew 11, 1 and 6, he said and asked, Jesus, you know, here yeah, I'm your cousin I'm in prison, waiting to be sentenced by King Philip. Are you the Messiah? Or should we look for someone else? And we saw Jesus sending back a response, but not the one he probably was looking for. And that John eventually was beheaded and lose his life in prison why Jesus was active on earth in his earthly ministry. So we have that as an example of what we call that answer prayer. And one of the interesting Jesus said is, blessed is the man who's not offended because of me, because of my will, because of what I allow or permit um, to take place in their lives. Acts 12 and 2, we saw Peter being set free, while James, the brother of of John, he was executed. He was not set free. And in both instances, the church prayed. So why were some of the biblical heroes of faith were able to subdue kingdoms by faith and prayer, work righteousness, obtain promises? They stopped the mouth of lions. Remember Daniel and the lions then praying? I mean, I would have visuals of that. There are drawings of Daniel praying over a rock and the lions lying next to him can't do anything. The Bible spoke about those instances, Hebrews 11 to the tree. But right in the same chapter, the same author by the same inspiration of the Spirit spoke about others who in faith and by faith were mocked, scourged, imprisoned, stoned, sawn in two, and slain with a sword, Hebrews 11 to the 6 and to the 7. He, 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 he made this conclusion that died in faith, but not receiving the promise. Unanswered prayer. As I give you many, many examples from Genesis to the New Testament that documents comfortably with no apology uh, instances for us of unanswered prayer. And so we see that it's not something that, that makes us uncomfortable in our faith and it's actually a reality that is well recorded in, in the Holy Scriptures. Um, even as we are wrestling with unanswered prayer and, and sometimes we will use those seasons um, to create untruths in our life that we begin to believe. And Lisa says, right, it's not so much our doubts and our questions that becomes a problem for us in our walk with God and our relationship and our faith. Sometimes it is the wrong things we begin to believe about the message of God and about faith and about God himself that actually leads us down a slippery slope 
and becomes even a further impediment to what we desire and believe in God to do in our lives. So the Bible has carefully documented unanswered prayer and reports that even those who die with unanswered expectations were men of great faith. And I love that. Uh, I've looked at that scripture because there's times when I prayed and I have those testimonies. God has done amazing things, blew my mind. And then there are times I pray and I believe the times when I've not received the expected answer I wanted, I felt like I prayed harder some of those times than the other times when I may have just said something and God responded. And, um, and what helps me is when he said in Hebrews 11 that those men who died not having their prayers answered or not having the outcomes that they would have wished for materialized all died in great faith. And that's why they were mentioned in the Hall of Faith. Recall in the chapter of faith, recall Hebrews 11, the chapter of faith or the Hall of Faith. And so they were mentioned even experiencing unanswered prayer. And that is important for us to understand um, as well. Even as we spoke about Joseph, how we saw um, his dream come to pass, his brothers borrowing to him and all of that. There was other aspects of his desires and dreams in terms of being better reunited with his um, with his, uh, with his ancestors that actually happened 400 years after his lifetime. So here's another scripture written by a disciple who heard Jesus promise in Mark 11, 24. When Jesus made that promise in Mark 11, 24 about whatsoever he asked for in prayer, believe in it should happen, uh, the disciple John was there. And then John later wrote in 1 John 5, 42, 15, Here's what he wrote, um, and I want to share this with you. He says, and this is the confidence. This is, this is the absolute assurance that we have towards Christ, towards God, that if we ask anything according to his will, and I believe it was Sister Denise, and then it was picked up by um, Sister Janelle and um, Minister Fire as well, this, this, this factor of God's will. And he's saying that it's not just what it, whatsoever reacts, mean that, you know, spoil true and we get whatever reacts, but it's whatsoever reacts in accordance to God's will that he hears us. And so the will of God is an important factor as we are praying. And we saw that even as Jesus is praying to God of Gethsemane. And many of us have a difficult time resigning ourselves, even in prayer to the will of God, for the fear that what God wills is not what we want. And that's why we say prayer is more of a journey and it's more of a relationship because as it brings us into the full expression of God in terms of knowing what is his perfect will. And I remember that when my dad was dying in August of 2015, of praying for, it went on for about seven, seven to 10 days and praying earnestly. I mean, I would go down with the anointing oil, one time I laid hands on him and he was on the vent and the machine and, and curtains were there. He said, wow, that was a powerful prayer. And my father was responding. He actually lifted out of his bed. He arched out of the bed um, as we were praying and praying with the power of the Holy Spirit and the evidence speaking in tongues. And I, I thought my scenario would be like, his eye was going to pop open and he was going to live. Um, but 10 days later, I'm in the gym of the, the, the hotel we were and God says to me, you always says, this is God, and I'm running and crying on a treadmill. He said, you always says that my will is perfect. You would not know I didn't want to say that because I knew how this conversation was going. And I said, yes, your will is perfect. He says to me, after seven to 10 days of praying for what I want, he says that my will is perfect. Why don't you pray for my will to be done? I let the machine run, in, run me to the back of the machine. I fell on my knees and on my face and I began sobbing. I was so afraid, so afraid of embracing God's will. Because my head, my heart, my spirit told me that after seven days of bombarding heaven with what I want, submitting and surrendering to what his will was for this religion for my life couldn't look pretty because it wasn't what Carl wanted. And in tears, after much sorrow, I was able to utter, let your will be done. And you would not know the peace. I continued sobbing, but the peace and the joy that flooded my soul. And right then I began to repeat Psalms 23 by heart. 
And I came to the part that says, Yea, do I walk to the valley of the shadow of death? I will feel no evil, for thou art with me. And that was just like a moment of release. God did that for me before I heard the news um, 20 minutes later because Clyde came onto the gym looking for me. They had called him and I wasn't with them to come to the hospital to, to say that my dad had passed. And he came and he looked at me, rest his hand on my heart and said, your dad is gone. And I look at him crying and said, I know. And it just told me that I was important enough to God for God to wrestle with me until I came into agreement with his perfect will for our lives and for the life of my father. Because his will is perfect in this life and in the life to come. But it's us walking with God with the chief intercessor, the Holy Spirit in prayer, who searches the heart of God, the seen or the known and the unknown world, to know what God's perfect will is. And he brings us through prayer into agreement with the will of God so that we can pray in accordance with his will and not in accordance to our earthly feelings or desires or wants. And I just wanted to share that with you as well. So whatever mentioned in Mark eleven twenty four 24 is anything that's in accordance to God's will. And as believers and as children of God, we should grow in our faith to actually learn to embrace the will of God as the expression of our prayers. Prayer is not about securing what we want from our limited perspective, which is earthly, which is limited, is finite. Prayer is, is us discovering what is God's good and perfect will for our lives and for those we love. Now, in the final analysis, I will say to you, prayer is not about results. It's about relationship. God wants us to interact with him. He wants us, like Jacob, to wrestle with him. Wrestle as Jacob wrestled with the angel in Genesis 22, 22 to, to 22. Why? So that we can get to know him, that we can trust him, and that we can remember him in all our ways. He wants us to become involved in our own life story that is being played out. He wants us to play an active role in the mystery of his plans for our lives and those we love. Psalms 129 says, before we were born, God write our story, our life story in his book. But he wants us to be a part of that as we pray and seek out and search out his will. He wants us to play an active role in our life story. And he's given us the privilege of prayer uh, to access this. This is what we must keep in mind. We must not see it as merely a service transaction. We pray by faith and receive faith as the currency and we get something from God. Rather, we will benefit much more if we see it as a relational interaction and not as a service transaction. And this is what Paul teaches us in the midst of unanswered prayer. You remember he said he prayed three times and each time he didn't receive the answer he wanted. But Paul taught us an important lesson that I believe is a part of our lives as well as we're going through COVID-19, as we're going through difficult relationships, as we're going through financial challenges, as we're going through setbacks in businesses and our unemployment. There are so many different seasons that can fall upon us in this lifetime. And some of us go to various seasons and like Job, some of us can go to multiple seasons all at the same time. And that's the worst scenario. You know, if we get serious circumstances by one, we could get the strength from one event to be strong for the next one. But sometimes life presents you with multiple challenges. Could be in your health, your finances, could be all at the same time. And, you know, it, it can really rock your feet. Uh, but Paul taught us an important lesson as to how to look at our life's trials. He says that in the midst of unanswered prayers of God not answering him based on his expectation that he had in his heart and mind, he said he learned to see our experience, the sufficiency of God's grace and the magnitude of his incredible power. So he saw the potential of God's power day by day as he lived out his life in the current context of his circumstances that God had the power to deliver him 
out of and fix his problem. But God also had this magnitude of power to sustain him within his problem. Without changing um, the, the, the majority factor, the overlying factor. And I thought about that because we have an incredible story among our grandparents. Have an incredible story, and I, I want to share with you, may help put it in context. I know it's 854. Um, there's something else I want to share with you about sometimes how we're responding to our offenses or the situations we're in. Actually, is can be a hindrance to the prayers we are offering to God as well. And so I'm hoping to get to that point before we finish. But my mind goes to my grandmother. I love and truth. We used to call her grandmother she Martha Shelley. We had all kind of pet names for her. She was just a sweetheart. I call her a sweetheart because one time I'm away in law school, she calls me, not me call her. You know, I'm the grandchild. I should be calling her. She calls me. And in this conversation, she has me laughing my head off, laughing till tears come my eyes. She is so conversational. She is so jovial. And after I hanged up the phone, I actually went to my wife and said, Reba, I had the most amazing conversation with my grandmother, and you would not believe or, or know that she is blind. There's no feel sorry for yourself. There's no poor me. What did God do to me? There's none of that. Instead, she's able to tease me and joke with me and, and just engage me in a way that makes me forget about my challenges while in law school, my wife in med school in such a way that I'm able to laugh at myself, laugh at life, and forgot that the person who's bringing me so much joy on a telephone conversation actually does not have the benefit of her eyesight. She doesn't have the benefit of her eyesight. She has dealt with um, diabetes for quite some time. Why am I sharing this with you? Because those are many things she's probably prayed about, um, and God didn't answer them. But I want to show you in the midst of that, God answered her for incredible prayer that to this day is one of the foundations of my faith. I remember that my grandmother got a sore on her leg. For people with diabetes, we know that these could become life souls. They can turn bad. They can go green or gangrene and you can lose your limb. And my grandmother declared she was going back to God the way she came, came from me. I'm going, I'm going to heaven the way I came. And she will declare by faith with diabetes, with a life soul that lasted for a long time and that seemed like it would not heal. She declared that by his stripes, remember what I said? She was blind, she had diabetes, but she declared over that life soul, by his stripes, I am healed. She refused to negotiate away her faith in God's power to heal her body even in the presence and the context of her reality. And guess what did God do for her, for that life soul? Something that the doctors, them tongue in cheek, you know, this can't happen, it ain't possible, the table, all the context, people in your condition, we don't see it happen. Well, for grand, grandmother, Mother Shelley, God healed her of that life soul. The one thing you would not find on her when she passed from this earth was anything wrong with her limbs. Skin like a newborn baby, healed completely by the power of God. And God did that for her while still allowing her to live with her diabetes and with the loss of her eyesight. And it has taught me in all things to be content and not to question the Almighty who does all things well. Blessed be his name forever. So here's Paul's prayer to the Colossians. He said, for this reason, he says, we heard it, we do not cease to pray for you and to add that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. So Paul is saying, you know what I say? I'm going to pray for you, even as you go to your challenges, that you be filled with the knowledge of God's will. What is his will? During COVID-19, uh, churches was closed. We were limited to 10, in per 10 people in, in person attended. What is God's will? To continue to live out his will, to continue to walk by faith, to continue to declare his message by faith, to be relentless in speaking what is true based on the promises of God. He says, I pray that you will be overcome or filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you'll be strengthened with all might, with his mighty power, according to his glorious power, 
for all patience and long suffering with joy. He talked about perseverance and enduring with joy. What did he learn? He learned that in whatever state I am, and that is, is found in Philippians 4, 11 and 30, whatever state I, I am, am in, to be content, regardless of my need. I know how to be a beast. I know how to live without, and I know how to abound. I know how to flourish. I know how to prosper. David said, riches increase, set not your heart in it. He said, oh, whether rich or uh, uh, hungry, I've known how to be content. And he was talking about a statement of faith, to continue to live in the realm of faith, regardless of my external circumstances, good or bad. Good or bad, he said, I know how to abound in my faith and to be content. He said, everywhere and in all things, I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Then he declares this, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul was talking from in prison, five years in prison, that ended in him dying for the sake of the gospel. And he is saying, I can do all things. When we preach this, we are preach like Paul is part of the, um, the health and prosperity movement in our day and time. Paul is speaking from the hardships of prison. Yet they made some of the strongest statements of faith that encourages saints all over the world. And he sends to us during these seasons of what seems like unanswered prayer, of difficult circumstances, of hardships, even as we go into Thanksgiving. He says, you have reason to be thankful. You can break out with expressions of joy. The God we serve is faithful. Blessed be his name. He says, that's why we do not lose heart. We won't quit. We never stop praying because we have this eternal perspective about the greatness and the faithfulness of God. And so I don't want you to keep that in context as you persevere through your seasons, as you continue to work in difficult situations by the will of God, just discern what God's will is. Not every situation that seems to go south, you have to abandon. Some people teach that. You know, not everything you have to run from. Some In some situations, God's going to ask us to stay, to remain, to continue to pray for a child when, when everybody, including the priests, have stopped praying. For you to be the one, like Hannah, to continue to believe and trust and pray. And what is the purpose of God in that situation? I don't know, but I know he has wisdom for it and he has a will for it. And I pray like Paul that he bring you to the full expression of understanding of his will with all wisdom and with all grace, that you will see the sufficiency of his grace in every life situation and understand the magnitude of his power for those who believe. But as we are closing, 901, one of the things I want to impress upon you is that we ourselves, how we respond to offenses and hardships in our lives, can actually become hindrance to the very prayer that we are offering up half heartedly. And sometimes without faith, that we can become the very hindrance to the answers to the very prayers and petitions we're asking God to do. And sometimes it is um, lost on us that we could be our own, our own enemy in terms of obtaining what we seek. Why do I say that? There are two things that actually affects um, or hinders uh, the responsiveness of God to prayers. And it's actually like we want God to answer for us as well when it's in, within the context of relationships, and then we will fix the conditions. So there are conditions precedent, the conditions that must be present before God responds. But yet most times because of how we're feeling, because of our hearts, we want God to answer for us. So it's like a chicken and egg situation. It's like a game situation. And then we will do what God asks us to do. And sadly, that's not how it works. That when God gives us instructions in his words, we have to follow the instructions to get the outcome. Naaman had to follow the instructions. If he had dipped seven times, but in the wrong river, he would still have leprosy <laughs> because God said dip in the Jordan. And so a lot of us are modifiers. We like to modify what God says. We modify the tithe. We modify the offerings. We modify prayer. We modify faith. We just the the we are just the modifier. We feel like we have every right to modify what God asks us or teaches us to do, and it doesn't work that way. And one of the ways we try to modify, we say, you know what? They hurt me. 
They're going to have to apologize for us. They're going to have to do this for us. God is going to have to come down from heaven. God is going to have to move heaven and earth, and then I will do my part. And God says, no, 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 no. That's not how it works, sweetheart. Let me tell you how it works so that you can stop interfering with your prayers and being a hindrance to your prayers. I want to give you the four references, then I'm going to give you the spiritual principle. In Matthew 6, 12, NIV, the Lord's Prayer, Jesus taught us to pray this way. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those condition. You see that? Forgive us our sins as we are forgiven those who sinned against us. He went on further in Matthew 6, 14, 15. So he tells us the reverse way. He said, if you are unable to forgive men of their sins, neither would your heavenly Father in heaven forgive you of your sins. So he told us the opposite way. If you couldn't understand it in the Lord's Prayer, he came out, he gave us a commentary note, and he said, well, this is what I'm telling you, that when you refuse to forgive, you stop the hand and the activity of God in forgiving you of your offenses or your hearts and your sins, and that's interference. And so he says, unforgiveness interferes with your prayer life. It interferes with your prayer life. It interferes with your answer to prayer. There's another scripture, Matthew 5, 23 to 24, that if you are praying, if you're making your petitions or offerings to God, and you, in your prayers, God reveals to you. Why is he revealing it to you? Because it's a hindrance. It's stopping up your prayers. That as you're praying, God reveals to you that you have art against your brother. God says, ah, I'm just giving you the answer to your prayer. Go and settle it with your brother. Then come back and keep praying. Why have, can you come back and, and keep praying? Because you have unstopped or removed the hindrance to your offering. God is, God is in love. God says, I'm present. You are praying. We are ready to engage in this relationship of <laughs> engagement. But uh, you're blocking your prayers. You want success in what you're about to do and what you're about to offer? Well, go ahead and fix your relationship and come back. Then we can we can move on. Um, First Peter 3 and 7 um, in the Good News Bible, GNT, Good News Bible. He talks about us respecting our wives. He talks about us. He says, have sense. You know, I want you to live with your wife with consideration, knowing that she's the weaker vessel that God has made a difference. There's a difference in the genders. There's a difference in how um, the sexes relate to life circumstances. You know, they may get more emotional. doesn't make them less intelligent. You know, they respond to life differently than you do. But that doesn't give you the right to belittle them and to marginalize them and to put them down because they are your partners in the faith. They're your equal yokemen, you know. Together, both of you can have prayers of agreement. He says, but if you don't develop consideration, if you don't develop understanding, and you don't treat them with respect, here's what happens. It hinders your prayers. Clear instruction. Four amazing scriptures taught by the Lord Jesus Christ himself and by the Apostle Peter that shows us that sometimes in our unforgiving, in our bitterness, in our pain, in our suffering, that we become the blockage, the hindrance, the stoppage to the very prayers we've been waiting years to see materialize in our lives. What come first, the chicken or the egg? Um, I don't know the answer, but I believe if you do it the way God says, just like Naaman following the prophet's instructions to the T, you will begin to see results in difficult circumstances. May God add his richest blessing to his word. And based upon that, I'd like to pray for you as we get ready to go into our Thanksgiving season. We also want to say to you, because Thursday is Thanksgiving in St. Thomas, uh, and Miller does not have a national day of Thanksgiving like the United States Virgin Islands. So we will be busy down here um, baking um, whole turkeys, 14 to 16 pounds, um, basing them with um, olive oil and all the next trimmings, um, doing the turkey stuffing out of the box. Um, with cranberry on the side. Um, and while many of our fellow saints in Anglo will be hard at work, so we have a day off. But because of that um, conflict in realities, uh, we're asking um, our Anglo brethren at CFC 
Um, you can fast all day if you so desire, but um, the day of corporate prayer on Thursday uh, will be um, limited to our morning prayer from 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. Um, so it'll be unhinged from a day of fasting, but we want to get together on Thursday mornings at 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. to just offer expressions of thanks given to God. So we want to encourage each other with expressions of thanksgiving, um, sharing our scriptures of thanksgiving, our prayers of thanksgiving, our quotes of thanksgiving, quotes that inspire us during the season of thanksgiving. And the purpose to hear is many voices expressing thankfulness to God, more so than lengthy prayers. We just want you to be a part of that. And that at the end of 7 a.m., we release you uh, from your Thursday obligation of fasting, uh, if you so desire. Uh, those of you who are diehards, if you desire to fast, you can, you can make that choice. But there is no obligation from a corporate standpoint um, for a day of fasting, while our friends and relatives and saints in St. Thomas are busy uh, feasting on turkey, cranberry sauce, and whatever else their hearts delight in. And so I don't want to bring you up to speed to that, but I do want you to get up early and participate in our morning prayer of Thanksgiving from 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. Um, on Thursday, two days from now. And so I give God thanks for many of you. I'm closing 9, 10. Are there any closing comments or prayer requests so that as we close, I can lift up those uh, prayers to God, especially prayers that are that may have been long-standing requests. I would just like to touch and agree with you, simple in faith, um, that you begin to see once again the activity in the hand of God, and that God will make all things plain to you as He reveals to you His perfect will and plans for your life. I'll give you a few moments, and I want. I just wanted to say this comment about Michelle Ford, your beloved grandmother, that yes. I want, want to know that everything Pastor say, said about Michelle Ford is the absolute truth. She was amazing. Her faith was like just unbelievable. When you look at Michelle Ford's foot, when she had gotten a scrape and it turned into this gaping sore, and she declared, that she going back to God with her two feet because yes. Dr. Dasmani was talking about amputation and you would never know by looking at her foot that she had a gaping sore. Yes. And so she has been, she was a, just an amazing person yes. to everyone. And she, she would be in a hospital and you would go look for her and she's entertaining you not you trying to lift her up. And so that's the kind of faith and, and the kind of life I think that waiting for answered prayer can, can bring us because I know she wanted to be healed, but he healed her foot. You know, he did so much for her that she was sick, but her healing came in ways that today still transcends yes. the life and the experience and and how God really wants us to be out yeah. of self into him. Yes. Amen. 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 And the scripture Amen. says that out of and from death, they still speak. And so as you, you know, that's how I chuckle because even in death, their lives still speak volumes of the power of God and, the, and of their faith and this incredible God who's available to all of us who believe, you know, as well. So just wanted to share. Thank you for confirming that because I tell you, it, it inspires me um, as I continue my walk of faith um, with the God that she loved. Thank you, Father. I pray that this conversation has been helpful to, to some or to many. And so as we close, I'm going to just pray God's divine peace to you. I'm going to join with the Apostle Paul in praying that God's perfect will will be revealed um, in your life and through your circumstances and that his grace will abound more and more where sin and offense abound may grace much more abound and may you see the incredible magnitude of his power the potential of his power to not only live but thrive 
in your difficult circumstances. Father, we give you praise. We bless and honor your name. We thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit that brings us into all truth. We thank you, Father God, that you are working even now through the circumstances of our lives, through our difficult relationships, through our parenting, through our pain, our suffering, our grief, our heart, heartache. And just like you told the disciples, you will turn our grief into unspeakable joy. We believe your message. And we thank you, Father God, that even now as offenses abound, even as they're being repeated or multiplied, your grace does much more abound to the glory and honor of God. You outshine every offense by your unmatchless grace. Thank you for the power of your grace that can reach us in dark and desolate places and fill us with unspeakable hope. We thank you for that. We thank you for the gift of your indwelling spirit. May you activate the, the presence, the power, and the gift of the spirit of us. May you alert us to the evidence of speaking in tongues by opening our hearts and minds to the full expression of your will and to the deep understanding of things seen and unseen. You said the spirit searches the heart of God and you also lead us into prayer. And as you search out the truths in the heart of God, may you make them known to your servants who desire to do the will of the Father while we live in the earth. Not only during the good times, Father God, but during the hard times. We live for the full expression of his glory. We live so that his kingdom will come and his will will be done on earth, even as it is in heaven. And we pray most, so, Father, that men will look upon us and see the potential and the magnitude of the power of God at work in us and through us to the honor and glory of his great name. We actually divine blessings upon those who continue to walk in faith. And we thank you for the manifestation of your purpose and plans we thank you for every miraculous outcome, whether it's instantaneous or born out of enduring hardship for a season. In the mighty name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. And Father God, as we go through this season of Thanksgiving, I pray our hearts will turn to those good memories. You say, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are right, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And may you cause our heart and our minds to reflect upon the goodness of the Lord as long as we live in the land of the living. And may you fill our hearts with your peace and your glorious and divine joy. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, the Lord, we pray. Amen and amen. We give God thanks for you. We love you. Thank you for being part of our conversation. Thank you for listening so intently. And now we release you to go on and enjoy your evening. Finish season that turkey, so it'll be good. And season for Thursday and get some rest. God bless you. Love you all. Good night, everyone. Pleasant rest. Good night. Good night. Good night, good night, night everybody. Good bless night, 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 everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night, evening, everyone. Good night, good night. Good night, good night Brother good Terrence. Good night, Thursday. Thank you.